Good morning. It's Thursday, July 10th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 24, and my name is Chris. We got a big, big show for you today. A lot of big news broke between uh, yesterday and this morning, and we're going to try to dig through some of the stuff that literally just hit while I was commuting into the studio. So to help me dig through, especially our first story, I'm joined by our esteemed group of Microsoft experts in the Mumble Room, a panel comprised exclusively of secret Microsoft employees. We can't reveal their identities, but they're here today to chat with us about our first story, guys. And then we're going to get all kinds of stuff. But Microsoft makes the headline today with a quote-unquote email that Microsoft's new CEO, uh, Satya Nadella, sent out, quote-unquote. Uh, and they also posted it online. It it really focuses on a few key areas for Microsoft. He says that Microsoft's going to focus on mobile and cloud. I will talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But mo they say Microsoft is a mobile-first company now in this email. And they're going to renew a focus on general productivity. And he reiterates Microsoft's long-term commitment to the Xbox. So it's really interesting. Because what it, what it what appears to be is sort of Satya Nadella sort of trying to take the narrative Microsoft, of Microsoft by the horns because they sort of lay out a whole map of the company here. They give you some really powerful imagery from inside the company, stuff that's, you know, like, uh, like here's a great shot of uh, Satya talking to a group internally at Microsoft. And, you know, it looks re like a really powerful kind of moment. Everybody's listening to him. I think the messaging here is this is what Microsoft stands for. This is Microsoft's view, our worldview. They put it right here. <clears throat> this is our culture. These are what we want to focus on. And here's how they describe themselves. And right in the middle of this big, it's almost like a presentation. It's really well done. It's, it's like uh, got uh, chapter markers and uh, all kinds of nice transition effects. And right snap, dab, right boom, right there in the middle. They say our core. And they have, a, they have an illustration of what the new Microsoft is built of. It's kind of funny because if you've been following the new Fedora Core stuff, it kind of reminded me a little bit of that. But they have Cloud OS around one ring, and then Device OS and Hardware around the bottom ring, and then Digital Work and Life Experiences right there in the middle. Ooh, right there in the middle. Here's how they describe themselves. They say, Microsoft is the product productivity and platform company for mobile-first and cloud-first world. We will reinvent productivity to empower every person and every organization on the planet to do more and achieve more. Now that's pretty bold. First of all, it says the company with the largest desktop market penetration isn't a desktop company. They're a mobile and cloud-first company. Now, I do take some issue just from like a general, something I always kind of rib Microsoft about is, even when they're trying so hard, they do seem to lack some level of focus. Because if I was going to be technical, how can you be mobile first and cloud first? If they're both mobile and cloud first, then they're both 50-50. And then neither one of them is first, right? You're either mobile first or cloud first, right? Aren't you? Good point, yeah. I mean, I know I'm being, I'm, I'm quibbling, but that's just, it kind of, to me, illustrates, like, this is them trying to be bold and artistic. You know, they've bolded certain words, and they've artsied it up and gave it a nice font. But then when you actually read the words there, it's like, ah, actually, it doesn't, uh, uh, kind of actually says you don't have focus. <laughs> that's actually what it says. But it's okay. I'm just quibbling. Um, I think what I did really like out of everything in this email, which I thought was pretty interesting, they talk about cloud OS. They say our cloud OS represents the largest opportunity given. Uh, we are given. We are working from a position of strength here with Azure. We are one of the very few cloud vendors that runs at hyperscale. The combination of Azure and Windows Server makes us the only company with a public, private, and hybrid cloud platform that can power modern businesses. That's... Debatable, but it's an, it's <clears throat> they are in a very interesting position there. Uh, later on, the, but here's the part that they talk about towards the bottom after they talk about culture and a bit, and you know it's all very good stuff. It's all culture, this Microsoft, that uh, you know we we love our people and all that kind of stuff. But then he wraps it with something that's very true, and I believe what is actually Satya Nadella's internal yardstick for how he's doing as a CEO, because investors and employees and the tech press. They'll all, they all have their own yardsticks for how they're going to decide if Satya Nadella is a success or a failure. I hope and I believe Satya Nadella's internal yardstick is laid out in one of the last paragraphs in this email. <clears throat> he says, finally, every team across Microsoft must find ways to simplify and move faster, 
more efficiently. We will increase the fluidity of information and ideas by taking actions to flatten the organization and develop a leaner business process. I think anybody who's followed Microsoft for a long time, and I feel because I do have several friends and I've had family members who work at Microsoft, I have some insights into what hinders them in some cases. And we see it as a public, too. When Microsoft shipped RT tablets, they couldn't even get their own internal Office division to make an RT version of Office. Because of the politics, they ended up shipping an RT tablet that dropped down to the Windows desktop so that way you could run Office. And then when you were done with Office, you went back into RT. Think about if Apple ships something like that on the iPad or Google ships something like that on a tablet. It, people would, it, nobody would buy that, and nobody did buy that. That, just those kinds of internal conflicts, if you're buying a Surface RT tablet, you're probably in that office world. You're in the corporate world. You want that functionality. That's why you're getting that tablet, and they couldn't deliver on it. And it killed that, I think, I think that killed the RT because it made it not a, not a realistic solution for businesses to be able to deploy at scale. RT had the, good, had the right price, RT had the right battery life, and RT had advantages if you're in a corporation and you want to be able to manage these devices at scale. But if you can't deliver on the core productivity functionality that people expect from a Microsoft platform, of course you're going to fail. And it's... They're their own worst enemy sometimes, right? And so when he says that they've got to flatten the organization and find ways to simplify and move faster, yeah, you do. No kidding. I mean, look at that. Look at how many things they have missed in the last decade where they were there. They had all the right pieces. They had music services. They had video services. They had mobile phones. They had the largest desktop penetration. They have the largest penetration in enterprise class businesses. And yet they still couldn't pull the trigger on owning the smartphone market because they couldn't get their crap together. So yeah, I hope they simplify and streamline. And, and this is Sachin Nadella saying, I recognize this is critical to us. We've got to work on this, and I'm going to take the bull by the horns here, and I'm going to try to set the narrative and set the tone. But I wonder, can a company this large, is that just too, is this kind of problems, these fiefdoms and, and these middle management layers and all of that, is that just too ingrained into the DNA? Or can a company at Microsoft's age and size, can they change? That, I think, is what Satya Nadella's true yardstick, at least for his own measurement of his success, will be. And if it's not, it should be. Because I think it's their biggest problem. Because they've been at the front lines so many times, or battled their way after years and years and years of losing money on a market. They'll climb their way up to the top of that market, and then they'll blow it. Because they just can't get it together. Sometimes, sometimes not, but most of the time. So good luck, Satya. And the whole email is uh, pretty long. We'll have a link to it in the show notes if you guys want to read through it. Mumble Room, any thoughts on the whole Microsoft thing? Uh, doesn't really surprise me. The new CEO seems like they need to almost redefine their brand kind of thing. They need to give the world something to talk about, seems like. Well, Azure and Xbox are sort of their strongest brands right now, I think. Uh, so... And they said they're going to focus and innovate there. All right, well, before we totally get off the Microsoft topic, uh, just to follow up, we talked about it a couple of days ago on the show. Microsoft has dropped their case with the no IP stuff and the IP resolution for uh, no IP users is coming back. I mean, we talked about this before. It's the dyna dynamic DNS service that Microsoft sees their servers. Um, then that shut down services for folks who are legitimately and you know using it for botnets. Uh, Microsoft surrendered the 23 no IP domains last week. A barebone statement that was emailed to journalists on Wednesday morning, uh, that was yesterday, said so the agreement settled a controversial lawsuit filed in late June that allowed the software maker to confiscate 23 new IP domain names before the service provider had an opportunity to oppose the maneuver. They were able to do it before, before no IP was even informed. And here's, uh, they say that the malware families targeted in the latest takedown affected more than 7.4 million machines on, on the Internet in the past year alone. This is according to Microsoft. Preserving the confidentiality of these planned takedowns is sort of like Microsoft's secret sauce. So think about this. So they don't notify the person that, hey, you are complicit in a botnet or you're being used for a botnet. They don't give them a heads up. They go in and seize the domains from them first, shut them down completely, and then go in there and tell them what's up. 
Wow. Now, Microsoft officials say that the reason why they don't contact them is because Microsoft's technique has evolved over the years. Company officials would do well to update it again and reflect on the learnings from this episode, however, uh, no IP passes along. Um, the reason why I think this is a dumb thing, so what Microsoft does is they do a surprise attack. The problem with this is the entire thing is built around the presumption that, in this case, it was a botnet. This botnet has a single source of control. The first thing that malware authors will do to combat this type of behavior is they will just build a distributed control system. So it's across multiple, multiple data centers, uh, uh, across multiple compromised machines. If they can compromise enough machines to, to install a successful botnet, they can have more than one or two control servers spread out over the internet. So pretty soon, that, I mean, that, that, that's probably already happening, right? I mean, that's probably already a thing. We're just not talking about it a lot yet because we're not the ones doing it. So this technique that Microsoft is doing is not only extremely heavy-handed, it's also a bit Orwellian because it's working hand-in-hand -hand with law enforcement and banks, so it crosses a private and corporate, uh, a private and public border a lot. It, it, it makes them play the role of the heavy, and they're able to do it to legitimate companies without notifying them first for a technique that could be easily worked around by botnet authors. So I don't, I don't think this is going to continue for much longer. Uh, maybe it will. I mean, we only hear about a small hand case or a small handful of these. Microsoft does this more often than we hear. But then when things go wrong, like everybody that uses no IP all of a sudden has service issues, then we hear about it. Uh, why don't we talk about Google unless there's any other thoughts from the mumble room on the Microsoft stuff? I'll move on to Google. <clears throat> okay. The next Google story is uh, Google is really trying to get folks to get off AWS is basically what this headline should read. Uh, Google working through third-party resellers. Is, and they're also trying to stoke their reseller market, is offering terabytes of storage for free. It's uh, two terabytes of storage for free for a year. That's nuts. you got to go through a Panzura, I think is the company name. Uh, let me check. Let me double. Is it Panzura? Yeah, Panzura. Uh, anyways, what they say is, uh, by comparison, Amazon offers services for infrequently asked data at one cent per gigabyte per month, which would equate to about $120 a year for one terabyte of storage. If you look at the Azure side, well, then they could, you could, if you're a business, you can get a terabyte for free. Um, or it, like if you, and then after the promo period, then it's like 2.4 cents a gigabyte per month. So what, what Google is trying to do is essentially get folks that have been uneasy about moving to the cloud to move over. This is from a Google spokesperson. It says, we want to encourage businesses to move to the computing cloud. We want to make sure our potential customers are not worried about cost as a barrier to entry. Now, privacy, let's not bring that up. Uh, there are free offers out there for gigabytes of storage, but terabytes is where it starts to get interesting for companies. So they're doing terabytes for free. And if you need it and you want to get in on that, I wanted to pass that along because I don't know how long that offer is going to be around. One last Google story, too, before we move off of Google. Uh, Chromecast mirroring is now actually a thing. We saw this demoed at Google I.O. Uh, I think some of the Google I.O., uh, some of the, my, my favorite moments of Google I.O. were the Chromecast stuff. This is one I'm very excited about because I think it's going to make doing demos of apps for developers a hell of a lot easier. Uh, podcasters now will be able to easily demo, uh, if they have a Chromecast hooked up to a capture device, easily demo uh, an, an app, things like that. So this is a really nice move, and it makes Chromecast much more uh, competitive with Apple's AirPlay, where you can also uh, stream the whole screen. And I, I would not be surprised if we don't see ways to soon uh, cast your entire um, Android screen via Chromecast to VLC. So you might be able to get your Android desktop on your desktop through VLC, at least to look at it. So that's pretty cool. And the update's going to, if it's, if it's not out by the time you're hearing this, it will be out very soon. Uh, they're pushing it out via the Play Store. Surprise, surprise. I don't know, about, I don't know if there's any device updates or not. I don't have a Chromecast. Um, so actually, uh, Chris, there is a there is a tool on Linux to let you send your um, Android device screen to a Linux uh, Linux screen. It's called Mirrorcast. Mirrorcast, like M I R R O R. I think it's M I R Cast. I'll have to check the the naming. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a tool that lets you do exactly what you just described. Send like an Android device. Eventually, they'll have it so that the Linux can be the client as well. So cool. you can send your your desktop to another desktop. So now that you're gonna have uh, now that Chromecast is around, though, do you think that kind of tool's gonna be needed? Well, if you've already got a, a device under your TV, like an XPMC or oh. you know, any kind of Linux based machine that you know could support this kind of feature, that would be quite cool. Mira cast, M I R A cast, and that that uh, sounds like it. Yeah, I should look into that. Ah, uh, so that sounds pretty neat. So I guess it what it must do capture on the Android device and then sell it over, uh, send yeah, it over Wi-Fi. That's actually, 
it's actually been baked into Android since um uh I believe Jellybean. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's baked in on on the Android side. It just needed right. adding to Linux, and there's there's some funky Wi-Fi like direct connect Wi-Fi stuff. So it only works on certain wireless cards, and okay. the the guy who maintains it is um, going to the Linux Plumbers Conference to try and g up some people to like get all the other wireless cards fixed and uh, and talk about his project. So you get that working in the settings in Android somewhere, and you make sure you're running the client on the Linux box, and then the Android device discovers it and just syncs yep. up. Or cool. Yep, that's it. Uh, all right. Well, hey, let's talk about this real quick story here from Singapore. It's a bit of a bummer. Uh, Singapore has passed a law to block illegal sites. That was announced back in April. Uh, there's a new am- amendment to Singapore's Copyright Act, which will provide content owners with the ability to make internet service providers in the country block illegal websites, such as things like the Pirate Bay. Uh, Singapore's senior minister of state uh, for law said that the law will give copyright owners greater ability to protect their rights in the online space. The relevance of the prevalence of online piracy in Singapore turns customers away from legitimate content and adversely affects Singapore's creative sector. Geez, I wonder if they've been consulting with U.S. experts. Hmm. The new law is reportedly set to come into force at the end of August, and copyright owners can apply to the court in Singapore without having to establish the liability of the network service provider, so have at it, everybody, because you don't have to prove it. It's too bad. It's too bad. Uh, hey, wh- hey, since Popey's here, I wasn't going to do this. Um, but I, I, I just have to take the opportunity since Popey's here. Just gonna do a real quick Bitcoin update. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, <laughs> just for you, Popey. Uh, the judge has denied Silk Road's demands to dismiss the whole case. So, uh, 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 Judge uh, DRP's in there, right? And he's like, "Well, hey, let's just, let's just, we should just drop the whole case because Bitcoin's not actually money. So, if Bitcoin's not actually money, then I can't get in trouble for doing all these money things you said I did. So, case over, right?" And the judge very much so said no. Uh, in like a 51-page ruling, as a matter of fact, can, uh, which Ars Technica said is a scathing opinion order, the federal judge presiding over the Silk Road case denied the defense's motion to dismiss all four criminal counts, rejecting every argument made. In her 51-page ruling, Judge Catherine Forrest did not buy any of the defense's argument. Among them was the claim that the money laundering charges must fail because Silk Road's currency of choice was Bitcoin, which he said is not money. So the judge says it is money. No, sir. And then last but not least, one last Bitcoin story, extra bonus round for Popes. Uh, the Bitcoin Foundation has hired a firm to lobby, lobby on Congress. So Bitcoin's, uh, Bitcoin Foundation's got themselves a lobbying arm now. It, it's, it's good, too, because they're Thors, the Thors and French advocacy, they've been around for a while. The announcement from the foundation represents perhaps the most high-profile Bitcoin lobbying effort to date. The lobbying efforts will seek to find a balance between privacy concerns and law enforcement as it relates to Bitcoin, clarify the U.S. government's stance on the digital currency taxation issues, and develop more inclusive but effective consumer protection rules. So there you go, Popey. There's your Bitcoin update just for you, sir. Thank you. I do appreciate you thinking of me. Yeah. Hey, uh, guess what? A thread's been started on the Linux Action Show subreddit about the uh, OSCON uh, up, uh, meetup that'll be happening on the 22nd or 23rd. If you're going to go to Portland, Oregon to uh, OSCON, let us know. I'll link the thread in the show notes. We'd love to see you. Perhaps, maybe, I'm either going to pre-record some episodes while I'm down there for Tech Talk or maybe do one live, but I don't think so. I don't think so, because I think I want to focus on getting interviews and stuff while I'm down there, get my, you know, because I'm only down there for a a limited amount of time. But we'll see. Either way, though, there will be a Tech Talk today in a couple of weeks while I'm down at uh, OSCON. But if you're going to be there, follow the link in the show notes and uh, shout it out in uh, the uh, comment thread so we can get uh, a list going. And last but not least, I'd like to remind you this show and the network is looking for your help to fund our future expansions. Go over to patreon.com slash today and pledge as much as you can. It's a monthly charge. Your contribution, all all proceeds from this Patreon, go to fund the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. We're trying to do some things here internally to get our house in order. Specifically, there's a few things I want to hire out for. And uh, to do that, we need budget predictability. We need to know how much we can afford. And we want to be able to do that without increasing the ad counts. Not, not, not because we don't love our advertisers, but because I think you guys prefer the content to ad ratio that we have now and don't really want to see that unbalanced. And this lets us sort of tweak that ratio. And the higher this goes, the more we tweak the ratio towards crowdfunding. 
Uh, that's a pretty exciting proposition just on its own if you think of sort of what that would mean for an entire network and what the ramifications of that would be. That, that's pretty profound. But just outside of that right now, we're just trying to get some short-term goals done in 2014, and we could really use your help. Patreon.com slash today. We have some different pledge levels there also listed out at the bottom that kind of give you an indication of how much you can help. And we have milestones we're reaching for. Our next one, uh, we're going to celebrate with a barbecue challenge once we get there, and we're pretty close. It'd be really great if we got to it while it's nice weather out. <laughs> so, uh, patreon.com slash today. Help fund the entire Jupiter Broadcasting Network and keep Tech Talk today on the air. And thanks everyone, all 233 of you over at patreon.com slash today. And uh, maybe just a quick check in on the potato salad. Bad news. Um, seems a lot of you pulled your funding. It's dropped from uh, like 60. I think when we saw it last yesterday, what? Yesterday, I think it was 69,000. Today, it's 44,000. <laughs> so a lot of people pulled out. I guess they didn't like them on Good Morning America. So uh, come on, everybody. Once you pledge, you pledge. I mean, I know it's potato salad, but you pledged your money. That's why I didn't pledge. Although considering the fact that his goal was $10, I think he's still going to be all right. But I think that's pretty funny. So there you go. Uh, that wraps up uh, Tech Talk Today for this week. Now, did you know that Tech Talk Today is live Monday through Thursdays? And we'd love to have you join us. <laughs> I got an e- I don't mean to, I won't say his name. I got an email, though. The guy was kind of upset that uh, he tuned in on Friday and I wasn't here. And he's like, well, what the heck, man? If you're not going to be live, you got to let us know. No, I'm never live on Fridays. I try not to do any shows on Friday because I got the business to take care of. I got business. So this is a, this is a Monday through Thursday uh, proposition. But I'd love to have you there Monday through Thursday, jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, and our robot will just auto-convert it to your crazy time zone. Wherever your monkey time is, the robots will take care of it. They don't care. They don't judge like I do. That's why I have them do it. You can also send your thoughts into the show. Click the contact link over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or even better, techtalktoday.reddit.com. Let me know what you want to hear about. If uh, you want more Bitcoin stories, just like Popey does, submit them to the Tech Talk Today subreddit, or vote them up or down. Or if you don't want them, vote them down. If you don't want us talking about CISPA, don't submit it and, or vote it down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that, I take that as sort of a temperature of what you guys want to talk about, and it's a great resource. I check it every single morning, techtalktoday.reddit.com, and you can contact me, Chris LAS, on Twitter. Boom! I covered all the bases right there. So, uh, in, in sort of... Uh, Solidarity for Angela, my wife, who got a really nasty bug bite on a, on a walk she was on yesterday. I got a product for her that will solve her problems. So if you're going to go out, it's beautiful here in the Pacific Northwest. If you're going to go out for a walk, make sure you take care of them bugs. I said take care of them bugs. She needs off. It's the mosquito repellent that really works. And here's proof. Look at those hungry mosquitoes go for this research man's arm. Now, a quick application of OFF. And look, they don't bite, they don't even light. Yes, with OFF insect repellent, they don't bite, they don't even light. So get OFF, OFF, the insect repellent that really works.